Grace and peace to you in the name of our Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Tonight we have gathered for Holy Communion to remember Christ's giving of the Last Supper, His arrest and betrayal, and His crucifixion. This is a service of shadows. We will be progressively darkening our sanctuary as we journey with Christ to the cross. I hope that you have a bulletin in front of you, either downloaded or printed. We'll be reading from John chapter 13, John chapter 18. You'll have those texts ready. Also, I hope you'll be joining us for communion this evening, either with our common loaf recipe that you've already prepared at home, or whatever you might find in your quarantined kitchen. We recognize that although we are not together, the Spirit unites us, gathers us together. And this is more than a simple remembrance. The Holy Spirit is active and at work within our communion transforming us all into the body of Christ. Let us begin our evening with prayer. Again, gracious God, who sent your Son into this world, flesh, to love, to teach. We pray, O oh God, that as he gathered with his disciples, gave them a meant that as we prepare to journey with Christ to the cross we would do so not out of obligation but out of love for you so love this world O God that you gave us Jesus Christ that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Meet us here, O oh God. Meet us wherever we are. By your Spirit, unite and connect us, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
For the last 40 days, we have been hearing Jesus describe the relationship that he wants to have with us through the I am statements. He is pointing to a deeper meaning and a deeper purpose for us all. You see, Jesus is not just describing who he is, but what he came to accomplish also for us. Tonight we are invited to come with Jesus and the disciples to the upper room to join with them as they celebrate their Passover meal. And then we'll follow him to the garden. We'll run away and hide. We'll watch from afar as he's arrested and forsaken. We'll hear his claims. We'll hear the accusations. We'll hear the denials. We'll speak them for ourselves. So come and enter the story. It's not just his story, it's our story too. Come and worship the great I am who lays down his life for his friends, who gives us the humble example of the servant's life and invites us to follow. Come and worship the one who goes to the cross for you and for me. Our first reading from John's Gospel, chapter 13. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and for this reason he said, not all of you are clean. Let us sing what wondrous love is this.
we are encouraged to come prepared. Not just to have the bread and the cup ready, but to have our hearts ready as well to take this act and remember that Christ went to the cross for us. Christ's body broken for us. And so we especially on this night, let us remember, let us confess, acknowledging that God's grace, God's mercy is for us in Jesus Christ. In your bulletin, you'll find our litany of confession. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. We have sought satisfaction in other places, attempting to fill our lives with empty, trivial meaning. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. We have not followed Christ's guidance or walked in his example, following our own prideful thoughts instead. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. We have sought belonging in other flocks, endangering our souls to false shepherds and ideologies. Jesus said, I am the true vine. We have trusted in our own power rather than relying on the genuine power of Christ within us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We have gone our own directions, believed in self-created falsehoods, and are headed for destruction. Let us continue in silence and offering our own personal confession. Amen. And all God's people say, Amen. Join me in our refrain. that we sung are voiced by that thief on the cross hanging next to Jesus. He knew. He knew that Jesus came to do what he said he would and that he knew that if he called out, remember me, it was his only hope. And Jesus said, surely this day you will be with me in paradise. Jesus offers these words of comfort to you. So my friends, know this. Be at peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our second reading from John chapter 13, beginning with verse 12. After Jesus had washed their feet, he had put on his robe and had returned to the table and said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I am your example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell to you, 
Servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. You know these things. You are blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Do you understand what Jesus has done? Jesus, as he comes to the table, he pauses and invites his disciples to experience an act of humble service. He does what a slave would do. He serves them humbly. He says, I am your example. Keep doing what I am doing. This is the example of the humble servant's life that I'm asking you to keep doing and do this in remembrance of me. These words have powerful meaning for us. Serve one another in remembrance of Jesus in honor of his humble life given up for us. Do this. Keep doing this. This for which I'm doing for you. Do this for one another. Do this for the world. And after he washed his disciples' feet, they reclined at the table. And after he exhorted them to follow in his example, we're told by the other Gospels that they celebrated the Passover meal together. You see, they had come together to celebrate Jesus' humble life of service. And we have come to celebrate Jesus' sacrifice and his love for us. Jesus invites us to come, to keep doing what I do, he says. What I do for you, you do for each other. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, We have come at your invitation to this table, this table of celebration, this table of sacrifice, this table of remembrance. And though we are scattered this evening in our homes, throughout our community, we know, O God, that as we gather in your name, you have united us. We pray, O God, your Holy Spirit to be poured out upon This bread, these bread, those bread, all our bread, O God, and on our cup, on our families, wherever we are. We pray, O God, your spirit to take these ordinary elements, to transform them wherever they may be into the extraordinary, the holy. Take our lives as well, O God our simple, humble lives. Use us for your holy purpose. We offer this prayer in our lives with the prayer that Christ taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On this night, the night that our Lord was betrayed, he sat at the table with that betrayer. On that night, the night that he was abandoned, He sat at this table with those that would abandon him. On this night, 
the night that he was denied, he sat at the table with him who would deny him. And he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. It's broken for you. Take and eat. And do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, our Lord took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new relationship, sealed in my blood with the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul later said that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. We'll come forward and partake in communion. I invite you to do the same in your own home. Gracious God, you who have united us, you who have sent your Son for us, we are thankful. We offer our gratitude as we live out graciously in this world that you love dearly. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Continuing now with our third reading. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of the disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter, therefore, motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, Do quickly what you are going to do.
Let us sing Sacred Head Now Wounded. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden where he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. And he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you, I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it 
struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer and the Jewish police, arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Ananias, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and the other disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, 
you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing around it warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. We're here this night, gathered around this table. We're here this night in the garden and in the courtyard. We're there with Jesus and his disciples. The disciples that would betray him, deny him, abandon him. And in the disciples, we find ourselves. Especially perhaps in Peter. You see, he is that proto-disciple, the first, our example. He is us. In him, we find ourselves we find our own inadequacies, our own imperfections, our flaws, our impulsiveness, our sin. Honestly, we can't fault Peter for his denials, can we? Would we have not done the same? Had we even made it into the courtyard, had we been brave enough to follow the mob to the high priest's courtyard, we too would have denied Jesus. We have, in fact. Why deny the Savior? What does Peter have to lose? Why lie? Why deny the truth? He's followed Jesus and the crowd to the courtyard of the high priest, into the belly of the beast, so to speak. He's warming himself up by the fire, his clothes becoming full of smoke, rising up from the burning kindling. There must have been quite a crowd there, right? And for Peter to believe that his deception could be believed, he's got to have some notion that he could blend in. And they ask him, aren't you one of his disciples? Sure you are. I know that you are. We all know that you are. I am not. I am not. I'm not. The words, they sting. He's trying to sound convincing. He's trying to make them believe, yet at the same time, he can't believe it himself. He's denying the one thing in all of the world that has given him meaning, purpose, and identity. He's denying the one who has done so much for him, the one whom just hours ago he promised he'd fight to the death for. I am not. So contrast Peter's words with Jesus' words. Spoke just a matter of moments earlier. The mob. The mob of the mighty military marches into the garden led by the betrayer Judas. And Jesus asked the first question, he says, who are you looking for? Jesus, the Nazarene, 
is their answer. I am he. I am the one you are looking for. Now, as many times as I've read this passage, I often have first missed this interesting point here. And I think it's amazing that you can find new insight every time you come to God's word. You see, Jesus asked the question, who are you looking for? They respond, Jesus the Nazarene. He answers with, I am he. And with those words, the Bible says, the mob stops, steps back, falls to the ground, stunned and immobilized. It's as if, well, we know that there is power in Jesus' words. And we see the authority here. There is a divine activity going on right here. A force beyond description or understanding sweeps the soldiers off their feet. It's as if God is saying, don't you understand whose presence you're in? Bow. Fall to your knees. You are on holy ground. You are in the presence of the one, the great I am. I am he. There's so much meaning in these three little words. And so do you understand all that Jesus is saying? I am the one who must fulfill all that history has set into motion. I am the one sent by God. I am the one God, the one true God. I am, I am. Friends, there's no denial. There's no avoiding. There's no running away. Jesus now meets his destiny square in the face. This is what he has come to do. It all comes to this moment. Jesus embraces his moment. I am he. And Peter? Just a moment ago, Jesus said to the impulsive Peter, put down your sword. Am I to turn away from the cup that the Father has given me to drink? This is what I'm sent here for. I'm ready. I am he. And now from Peter, I am not. Just as these steps of selfish, selfish, selfless sacrifice define Jesus as the one, Peter's denial is a definition also. When Judas left the table, Jesus warns the disciples that they all will forsake him. And to Peter, Jesus warns him that he will deny him three times before the rooster crows. And the now comes, I am not, three times. Peter is flawed. Peter is imperfect. Peter is a sinner. He knows the sin that he shouldn't do and does it nonetheless. Jesus knows this. Peter knows, Jesus knows Peter is flawed. Jesus knows Peter is imperfect and Jesus cares about Peter, cares for him and warns him that this sin, it's going to hurt him. It's going to hurt himself. Jesus knows that Peter is going to be hurt, painfully hurt by his denial, but he can't stop him. Peter has to go through it. Jesus has to go through it. Jesus goes through it all. The betrayal, the denial, the suffering, the anguish, the crucifixion. Knowing that Peter is flawed. Knowing his disciples are weak. Knowing that this world is full of sin. He goes through this, not in spite of all this, but because of all this. Jesus goes through it because 
we have gone through our own sins and failures, all of us. Those words, those three small words, what power there is within them, power to hurt, power to define, power to change. I am not. I am not one of his disciples. I am not. Those words, they sting, they wound, they change Peter. In that moment, he claims his new broken identity. He claims his new flawed definition. And his words, they become true. I am not. I stood in that same courtyard where Peter made his denial during my visit to the Holy Land in 2014. And underneath this courtyard is an ancient church where there are even more ancient structures, dungeons. Dungeons with no doors. In fact, just a hole carved out of the rock at the top to throw a man down and then lift him back up. And I stood in those dungeons, the dungeons where Jesus said, I am he, that Jesus where he waited, where he waited for his final trial and his beating to begin, to walk to the cross. It's a holy place, a somber place. I am. For the last 40 days, we have been hearing Jesus describe the relationship that he wants to have with us by describing who he is. I am, he says, and that these point to a deeper meaning and purpose that Jesus wants for us. He's not just describing himself, but all that he is and all that he's come to accomplish for us. I am the bread of life. I have come to provide for you. I have come to give you all that you need. You are to depend on me. But our reply, I am not. I'm the light of the world. I came to direct your lives. I came to be your direction. You are to be my follower. But our reply, I am not. I am the good shepherd. I came to call you my own. I came to give you a family, to give you belonging and a purpose. You are to be my sheep. And our reply, I am not. I am the true vine. You are the branches. You are the fruit bearer. I am not. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me. No one comes to the Father except through me. You are my beloved ones. I've given it all for you. No. No, I am not. You see, Jesus knew the denial that was in Peter's life. He knew that Peter would claim those words. He knew that Peter was flawed. He knew Peter needed to go through it. Jesus knew that denial is in our lives. He knew that we too would claim those words. He knew that we are flawed sinners. Forsaken by all. Jesus goes to the cross bearing all the abandonment, bearing all the denial, bearing all the betrayal. Why did Peter deny Jesus? So that denial could go to the cross and be redeemed. So that our denial could go to the cross and be redeemed. 
Jesus bears our sin, our flaws, our imperfections. There is no sin that Jesus doesn't take to the cross. There's no sin that cannot be forgiven. Jesus, he is the one. The only one who can save us, who can free us, who can restore us, who can renew us and transform us. He is the only one who can redefine us. Those three words, as hurtful as they are, it's okay to say them because there is context in which they make sense. I am not Jesus. I am not perfect. I am not in control. I am not able to save myself. I am not able to do this on my own. I am not the Savior. I need Jesus. I need Him to forgive me. I need Him to save me. I need Him to lead me. I am not my own. I belong to the One. Let us pray. I am not I am not able, O oh God, I'm not able to bear the weight of my own sin, of the shame, of the guilt. I am not, but you are, O oh God, you are. You have bore our sin, our guilt, our shame. You have taken it to the cross. And there it was nailed. And all that goes to the cross is redeemed. Is set free. Comes and renewed. It is to this, O oh God, we claim. It is to this, O oh God, we hold fast. Yet in the next hours you will go alone because of our sin. We can't. We can't bear it. And you did. O oh God, Oh God, thank you for your love, your grace, the strength that you endured, the weight of the world's sin on your shoulders, and took it through the cross for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us sing when I survey.
as we now darken our church, remove all the familiar, all that we have set aside for specific purposes, our cross out front draped now in black, our sanctuary now stripped as we remember, as we celebrate, and as we give a solemn observance the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ with a sure and present hope that Sunday comes.